Community-centered, community-supported. Alaska Public Media. Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. Alaska's last living framer of the state's constitution has died. Vic Fisher was 99. I do want to point out that participating in the Constitutional Convention was a fabulous way of being part of democracy and state building. His legacy in our state is huge. We'll hear about some of his major accomplishments as we honor Vic Fisher tonight on Alaska Insight. Good evening. Alaska has lost one of the people who helped build the state's foundational ideals. Vic Fisher was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention that paved the way for statehood. He helped communities across the state plan their future. He was a champion of equity, civil rights, and free speech. Tonight we're going to review Vic Fisher's life and work and the impact his legacy will continue to have long into the future of our state. I'm joined by Jane Anvik, Vic's partner in so much work throughout Alaska and his wife of 42 years. Thank you so much for being here, especially on such a difficult week. Thank you. I'm really proud to be here to talk about Vic. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jane. And also with us this evening is Charles Wolforth. Charles is a former Anchorage Daily News reporter and columnist. He's written several books about Alaska and helped Vic Fisher write his memoir called To Russia With Love. Charles also served two terms on the Anchorage Assembly. Charles, welcome. Thanks also for being with us this evening. Thank you. In a life as productive as Vic Fisher's, there's a lot to discuss. Let's start off with some of his own words. He came to Alaska in 1950 after serving in the Army during World War II. After that service and his earlier years in the lower 48, he saw raw opportunity in Alaska but felt the territory should move towards statehood. While I was still at Wisconsin, I had voted for president, I had voted for United States senator, and I came to Alaska, and Alaska was as wonderful in every way that I could think in terms of the physical uh, and the human uh, surroundings, uh, and I had everything except I was no longer a full-fledged citizen of the United States. The convention was organized in order to take a step forward uh, toward becoming a state. And so those of us uh, who were active in the statehood movement ran for election and uh, so uh, most everybody at the Constitutional Convention was solidly for statehood, and the Constitution was a major, a critical part of becoming a state of the United States. It was one of the coldest winters we ever had up in Alaska, and uh, uh, and we persevered and uh, wrote what is probably the best constitution in the whole United States. It is very much like the United States Constitution in terms of being short and specific, uh, 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 laying out the foundation for the state without going into a lot of detail uh, that would have required changes. 
Oh. All right, so good to start off with Vic's own words. Jane, again, thank you for being here. My sincere, sincere condolences, and we really appreciate your time. In reflecting on, on these comments that Vic just made about that event, the Constitutional Convention, what did he talk about most from the, those days? It must have been such an exciting time in Alaska. He did say it was perhaps the most thrilling activity he was engaged in when it comes to political uh, and government life because you're creating new things. And from his perspective, Article One, Section 1 of the Constitution talks about not only the rights that you have, it then says comma, and you have corresponding responsibilities to the state and to your community. And for him, I'd say his life was largely measured at trying to encourage people to participate in their government, and at the very least, they had to vote. I heard him several times tell individuals who said, I hate government, I don't vote. And he said, well, then I don't have to talk to you because you don't count. <laughs> you don't count. You're not using the tool that we gave you to be engaged in, in the government. Yeah, counting yourself out, actually. Charles, when you think about the politics of today and, and what Alaskans of differing political ideologies accomplished in the 1950s, what really stands out to you about that? Well, it's a, it's a complex uh, question because Alaska was so different in those days. Um, we can talk about there being an amazing consensus uh, around the Constitution and the work that Vic was doing, but um, it didn't really involve, include the Native community, which was something that became very important to Vic uh, as someone who, who helped birth the AFN in the 1960s. Um, but I think in terms of uh, when we think of our Republican and Democratic partisanship and the things that pull us apart, uh, those things were present in those days. But when it came to statehood, there was quite a common goal. And folks pulled together uh, and all had a common belief that they were Americans and they wanted to be full Americans. And um, the, the convention that happened in Fairbanks uh, in 1955 was really a unique moment uh, where politics was set aside and people who really cared about Alaska thought through what the problems would be for the creation of this new state and set a plan which has been held up as a model, uh, as, as, an, as a very perfect constitution. And Vic had a huge part in that. And he was, and the debates were, were heated and people worked really hard. Um, but in the end, uh, they, they pulled together and there was only one delegate who, who uh, was ultimately opposed. Uh, they all supported it. And, and I think they all went forward through life thinking of it as one of their greatest accomplishments. Well, against that backdrop, did he ever express any regrets about any part of it? Did, did he say through the years that he wished maybe some parts would have been changed or worded differently? Were there elements of it that um, he thought could have been done better? Um, yeah, there are definitely things that could have been uh, done better, but the Constitution ha had an amendment system, which has been used a number of times um, and has been further perfected through the years. And that goes back to the basic philosophy of the Constitution, which is something Vic talked about a lot and which relates to what Jane was talking about just now re about responsibility. And that was he, he believed and I think the other delegates believed that the Constitution should be very open ended. It should set up a structure for how Alaskans would govern themselves, but it wouldn't pre make decisions. It would be up to each generation as it came along to understand the problems of Alaska and take responsibility for them and solve them in their own way. And that was the inherent optimism that Vic Fisher brought to the Constitution. It was a belief in people and a belief that they really can come together and solve their problems if they love Alaska and if they want to do what's right. And I think he died with that belief, even though there have been some very frustrating times and some real reasons to wonder if that uh, is gonna work. But inherently, I think he thought, there's no way people in the past could look, you know, 80 years into the future and see what was needed. That would be up to us. And it is up to us because of the constitution they wrote. Thank you for that. Jane, when you and I talked the other day, you uh, mentioned his values, written in his words in the first few pages of his memoir, To Russia With Love. You have a copy of it with you today. Tell us about those values that helped him 
shape his work and and the con on the Constitution and also across the state. These are his values for life, and they apply to all the pieces of his life that he got to work with. But first and foremost, he was a man who believed in in the rights of people to be able to represent themselves and the individual rights of individuals. And he was opposed to all forms of discrimination. He hated bullies. And he didn't think that there was any room in, in the government structure for the government to serve as a bully. He needs to make sure there's a two-way conversation. He was also really dedicated to those without power. He devoted most of his time to making sure that people who were without, who were poor, who were on, uh, discriminated against, who were in any way harmed be because of discrimination, that there would be a step up for them to do that. To that end, he was really devoted to making sure that the public education system in Alaska would provide equal access to education for everyone in the state. Thank you for helping us better understand uh, his strong feelings about equity and that's such a, uh, you know, a topic today as well that as we're seeing in so many places so that life of service in that regard is so important. Charles, you worked with Vic for three or four years on his memoir. It was published in 2012. It's my understanding that he wasn't really enthusiastic about writing a memoir, initially anyway, so writing is always difficult maybe even more challenging with a partner. Talk about how the two of you work together and what he most wanted people to take away from this book. Well, the reason why Vic uh, wasn't that enthusiastic about writing a memoir, and he took many, many years of convincing by Jane and by uh, many friends and family members, was because he simply did not have a big ego. Most people who write a book about their own lives just are egotistical and what does everybody know about them and and Vic was not it did not have these narcissistic qualities that are so common in a politician um, the other aspect that made him reluctant was he really liked to think about the future and he really liked to be with people and writing a book especially one that's uh, a memoir is about thinking about the past and it's about sitting in a room all by yourself and so those were two things that were totally opposite from Vic's personality um, so he tried because everyone told him he should do it and he made very little progress and that's when uh, Jane and Vic approached me because I'd written books previously uh, I'd done one with uh, uh, Governor Wally Hickel and one with Dave Rose and I've done more since then and said you know can you help us and so we did and it turned out to be just a wonderful delightful fulfilling experience for both of us because essentially he would tell me the stories I would put them on the page and then he would work with that language and, and make sure it was his own. And um, it took a long time. We did, uh, I think, 130 interviews, many of them hours and hours long. And we talked about it basically every step of his life, much of which, obviously, most of which never made it into the book. But um, the process of talking and then going back and forth with the words until they were right. And, and in the end, I think he was really glad that he'd done it. And, and uh, I, I, I it was very well received. I think people think it really did reflect him. Staying with you for a moment, Charles, in uh, in the lead up to last year's vote, the the 10-year vote on holding another constitutional convention, in, in speaking with Vic about that, he was quite opposed to that uh, convention happening, but he said that he wasn't absolutely opposed, as you referenced earlier, to having another constitutional convention. He said it shouldn't be a document that just sits on a shelf somewhere. But he felt now wasn't the time. What did he have to say specifically about why he felt like it wasn't a good time to do so now? Well, I think uh, Jane would have more to say about that than I do because she was super involved in that campaign. But in general, I think he felt there, was a mechanism, there are two mechanisms for amending the Alaska Constitution. One is by amendment, and the other is by constitutional convention. And the big risk of having a constitutional convention in a time of great division and disagreement is you start legislating in the Constitution and determining for all of Alaska's future issues that really should be decided, um, you know, at, at the, uh, in, the in the legislature and in an ongoing process of politics. Um, so uh, I, I don't think many Alaskans like the idea of suddenly opening this can of worms and letting people go and fight over what was going to be in the Constitution and have that be sort of our permanent 
document. But I would really defer to Jane because she did Yeoman's work on that on that issue. Yes, please, Jane. What uh, what's what did he was he most troubled about in in this recent round? He was very concerned about the divisiveness and the and the rhetoric uh, associated with having a difference of opinion. So he thought that the community of Alaska was so divided and so entrenched, which is so different from the situation that they were in in 1955. But he believes strongly that we have the power, as, as Charles said, to amend. And we have amended the Constitution many times. We amended it to create the permanent fund. We amended the Constitution to provide for the privacy provision in the Constitution. We have the ability to change it and that that provides the guarantee that the citizens still have a right to be able to do it. He was just concerned that the angry conversation, the angry concerns of some factions in Alaska would, would just uh, harm the structure of the government. It was just too heated a time to hold another convention. Vic's early years in Germany and Russia cemented his beliefs regarding equality, anti-racism, and personal liberty, and especially his strong feelings about capital punishment. Let's hear from him again. I've had sort of a, a you might say, public interest as well as individual interest in ma making life better for the community, for your society. And uh, in, in part, it's been to overcome the evils that I have seen and to strengthen the positive things that a human being can be. I'd seen the state in Germany killing Germans, in Russia, on the Stalin, killing a million people on more than one occasion, the state killing its own people. And I just didn't, didn't, couldn't stand that happening in, in Alaska. I was elected to the last territorial legislature that met in 1957. And my uh, most important contribution was being the co-author of the uh, repeal of the uh, death penalty in Alaska. Which, which, which was very important to me, uh, uh, based on my abhorrence of the power of the state to kill its citizens, as I had seen in Germany and in Russia. So, Jane. About 27 states and the federal government still have the death penalty. Uh, a Pew Research study from 2021 found that more than 60% of Americans favor it for murder, even though nearly 80% are concerned uh, about the risk that innocent people may be put to death. Was Vic mainly opposed to the idea of governments having lethal power over their citizens, or was it more about the fairness and who ends up getting death sentences? I think both and that he was really opposed to, to having the state have the right to kill people. You, we, have a, we do have the right to remove people from society who are a harm, potential you know, risk of harm for other people, and they can go to jail and stay there. But he did think that if you looked at most of the statistics about who was the victim of, who, became, who was killed it, by that process, there were many, many, many people who were, the vast majority were of minority race or, uh, and the majority were poor. And so if you were poor and black or Alaska native in Alaska, those are the people who were put to death by the state. And he found that, that the process is unfair to the least of our brethren. Mm -hmm. 
Anything to follow up there, Charles? No, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and, you know, he was involved in that, that very early stage when not that many people had been executed, but they had essentially all been people of color uh, with uh, Warren Taylor, who was his comrade uh, in the legislature, who was a, a lawyer who represented a lot of those people and knew the cases and made one of the greatest speeches uh, ever at the legislature, uh, winning that. Yeah, but then Vic didn't give up. I mean, he didn't say like, okay, uh, we won that. Uh, don't worry about it anymore. He stayed involved, you know, from that day in the late 1950s until his death uh, just uh, Sunday, continuing to fight that issue. And every time it came up, he was there to talk about it. And, you know, I will miss him a lot as a dear friend and a wonderful man, but I'll also miss him as an incredible voice for that, you know, that that voice of, uh, of the such deep ethical commitment and the voice of history which would still reach us every time these issues come up and remind us of what was right um you know it's gone and that's and that's what's very sad mm -hmm. charles his accomplishments in building alaska are so numerous as we've been talking about in the 60s he happened to get a high level appointment in washington dc and that aided in rebuilding south central alaska after the 1964 earthquake tell us about that um, that's right. Well, Vic had, had worked in uh, uh, housing and urban renewal. He had a degree in uh, urban planning from MIT, and he was very well connected politically, obviously, and having been in the Constitutional Convention in the legislature. So he received this appointment in the John Kennedy administration and stayed in the Johnson administration, uh, high up in the housing um, uh, department. But it had a different name than it does now, uh, essentially the housing and urban development is what it's called now. And he was in that position when the Great Alaska Earthquake hit in 1964 and was called to the White House uh, to attend a cabinet meeting, although he wasn't yet a cabinet member with President Johnson, and flew on Air Force One and, in fact, uh, slept in the president's bed uh, uh, on the way to Alaska on the very first visit of federal officials to Anchorage to see what had happened. And then for the next uh, year, he was intimately involved in rebuilding housing, which was a very, a very uh, challenging thing. If you think about all the homes that were destroyed, that still had mortgages. You know, if you think think about your home being destroyed right now and the house is gone, but you still you still owe the money to the bank and now you need another house. So the federal government had to step in. A lot of money had to be spent. The old, old uh, construction had to be destroyed. In the case of Valdez, a whole new town had to be built in a new location. Um, extraordinarily complex. And the fact that it was able to be done so rapidly uh, was a credit to Vic and many others. Obviously, it wasn't wasn't uh, only his doing, and was really in terms of American history really significant because it was the first time when the federal government took total responsibility for a disaster. Prior to that, Americans really didn't think it was the federal government's job to come in and fix a major natural disaster. It was a state job. It was a local job. This was too big for the locals, and President Johnson decided to nationalize it and, and really. Now that's our complete expectation. If there's a disaster, we always think it's the federal government's job. Yeah, such a big transformation, and today we see the need, too, across the nation. Uh, he uh, was the director of the University of Alaska's Institute of Social and Economic Research, and as you mentioned earlier, even had a hand in helping the formation of the Alaska Federation of Natives, AFN. How in the world did that come about? He had spent many well, well, Go ahead. Charles. No, go ahead, Jay. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Anyway, I couldn't tell if you were looking at me or Charles. So I <laughs> thought I said that, that he had been working with the with a lot of rural communities in Alaska and had the opportunity to see what kind of opportunities existed. And he became a good friend with the people who were doing the Tundra Times newspaper. And Howard Rock was a person who was doing that. And they were very good friends about what we could do together to try to create a way that all the Alaska Native people who were far flung, but without cell phones, without computers, without any communication structure that would allow people to come together. So he was really engaged in trying to get that happen through, through the, the Tundra Times. Mm -hmm. So amazing, all these accomplishments. His work in the legislature, Jane, he was elected to two Senate terms as an Anchorage Democrat in the 1980s. What was his working relationship like with politicians from across the aisle? He worked with anybody that would uh, work on a project that he was engaged in. So he could easily work across the aisle. 
because again, the partisan nature of the state, even at that time, was not as divided as it is today. Uh, he was very good at making sure that, that if there was a pride at the time, the pipeline was completed and the state started receiving billions of dollars, which was a very different situation than what had been before. So there was opportunities to build infrastructure, to build roads and highways and ports, but there was also opportunity to build social infrastructure. So for example, when it came to domestic violence, he, he created a bill that allowed domestic violence shelters to be built in 12 communities. Those were people from across the state, so and across those, those party lines as well. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here this evening. Alaska owes much to the decades of vision, hard work, and dedication of Vic Fisher. We're going to give Mr. Fisher the final word tonight. Participate, be involved, be stand up for democracy, um, fight discrimination wherever you see it, and above, above all, be a participant in your state, in your community, vote, always vote.